This is the Weather Lounge here at Weatherworks. Hi there, and thank you for stepping inside and pulling up a chair here in the Weather Lounge. I'm your host, meteorologist Brad Miller, and our budding podcast comes to you from our Weatherworks headquarters located in Hackettstown, New Jersey. And joining me as always is my co-host and fellow farmhand, meteorologist Mike Mahalik. Hello there, Mike. <laughs> hey, Brad. I-, I don't know where you're going with this. Why? Uh, farmhand business uh that doesn't seem like it would ex- uh, describe a meteorologist well i'm kind of putting in some hints into the introduction to kind of give listeners an idea of what we're talking about today can you uh, guess mm, maybe something to do with farming or planting Ooh, ding 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 you got it mike let's show him what he won ladies and gentlemen <laughs> all right well that's that's kind of uh I think that's probably one of the silliest introductions that I've heard so far, but it was a good time. Um, But uh, yeah, you know, speaking of which, speaking of farming, speaking of the weather and and, and planting, you know, we have Denise Stevenson from Donaldson Farms, uh, which is located here in Hackettstown. So Denise is a greenhouse manager at Donaldson Farms. And Denise, we welcome you. To the weather lounge, and I just apologize for Brad's crazy introduction. Sometimes he goes a little bit off the cuff, and uh, then we don't know what's going on. (laughs) It's a pleasure to be here, gentlemen. Thank you very much for having me. Well, it's that time of the year, you know, Denise. Everyone wants to get that green thumb. They want to start planning. They want to start mowing their lawn. I know Mike can't wait to get that first uh, lawn mowing done. That's for sure. Well, it is March. (laughs) <laughs> yeah well, well i mean oh april now oh, it it's we're, april now we're, yeah we're recording this on april 1st so it's it's not a joke you know this is a real podcast <laughs> <laughs> we're not a joke <laughs> <laughs> yeah goodness um but uh but yeah denise uh, why don't you uh just kind of introduce yourself a little bit and um you know how you got started into you know planting and 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 being the manager over there at donaldson farm well, that has always been a passion, um, gardening and planting since uh, my younger years. I have been working here at Donaldson's Greenhouse and Nursery since 1999. Um, it has grown substantially since then, um, a lot more diversity than we started out with, but um, we do a lot here. It's a great place to um, not only work, but it's a great place to visit. Um, we carry um, a complete line of everything you could possibly want to plant a vegetable garden, uh, to plant a flower garden. We do trees and shrubs. We sell nursery items. Um, so we're pretty much all about planting, and we are in the midst of uh, the Donaldson family farm. Uh, so we are pretty much surrounded by acreage that is being planted in the fields of all the crops uh, that the Donaldsons grow, not just for their farm market, but to wholesale out to uh, supermarkets and other stores um, and vendors as well. So it's a pretty big operation here, and uh, I'm really proud actually to be a part of it. And um, the Donaldson family really does a a fantastic job with uh, their growing practices, and they are very, very big supporters of the community. So it's really an honor and a privilege to work here and work for them. Yeah, my, Mike and I uh, came out there a couple summers ago, actually, uh, for one of the, uh, the the summer junior camps, and uh, we just talked about weather and and I'll tell you, the kids were very interested. It's, I mean, you know, weather and, of course, planting and farming hand in hand. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, you can't have one without the other, basically. That's for sure. Very reliant. All the satellites, all the weather data it really uh, controls a lot of what goes on, you know, farm wise. And those kids, you'd be surprised how into uh, different things they are planting and and growing stuff. And it's really great when we're able to um, do the summer camps and let them know, um, you know, food doesn't come from ShopRite. <laughs> food comes from <laughs> the farm. Uh, so it's a it's a really good experience for them to be able to come here and see where their uh, where their food gr- comes from, uh, to be more cognizant of their environment and uh, teach them some stewardship of the land, pretty much. So it's an honor to be able to do that as well for you know the future generations. 
Yeah, I remember, like Brad said, when we were there, um, you know, really nice uh, place over there at Donaldson Farms. If you're ever looking, you know, to pick up some, you know, vegetables and stuff fresh from the farm, I mean, tons of stuff you can get there in the uh, in the shop. And uh, um, I do like going to those type of going to the farms and and going direct to where they're coming from. I, there's a there's an egg farm near my where I live too that I go to get some eggs. Um, you know, it just seems like things are fresher. It's great to eat local. <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. You know, it was picked that morning. Yeah. And I think, it, and I think it's really great to, you know, su- support those local farms and those local uh, egg farms and things like that. I mean, you know, I, I really do like to do that. I mean, it's, you know, of course the grocery stores are great, but you know, getting those fresh, fe- fresh vegetables are just fantastic. Absolutely. And it's better for you. Healthy, healthy to eat local. All right. So the big question is, Denise, you know, we're now into April and the weather, you know, Mother Nature still has tricks up her sleeve. And it's 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 that time of the year again, like you want to get out there and start doing stuff. But you got to be careful with certain plants and flowers still, don't you? Absolutely. She's a little unpredictable at this time of year. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you get a couple 60, 70 degree days and everybody's in their shorts and ready to plant. And then we'll have um, snow squalls or we'll have a, a nice 19 degree night. And that'll just um, kind of push everybody back a little bit. Um, there's a lot of great stuff you can do early on uh, that you should be doing. And then there's some stuff you absolutely should not be doing. All right. Well, I mean, maybe you could walk us through that right now, because, I mean, look, I mean, we still get freezes that can happen, um, you know, as late as maybe the middle of April. We've had them even into May a couple years ago. We had a very late frost, which is unusual, but nonetheless. So there was even some uh, snow. Yeah, a couple of years ago on Mother's Day weekend, it snowed. There was a little uh, surprise for us all, but... um, There are plenty of things you could be doing right now, prepping your garden, um, cutting back your rose bushes. There are some great plants that you can start putting out a little early. Um, Cold weather plants, uh, flowers include pansies, snapdragons, stock. Um, There's, you know, there's a nice array of things that don't mind the cool weather and actually prefer the cooler nights. Um, With regard to vegetables, uh, cold crop vegetables are perfect for this weather. Uh, We start with peas. We um, can also plant lettuce and kale right now, broccoli, cabbage. Um, there's There's a nice assortment of cold weather vegetables that you can start now that will not be affected by any, um, you know, any severely cold weather. What What's something that you definitely got to wait at least a couple more weeks for? More of the summer vegetables, I guess? Tomatoes. <laughs> Tomatoes. Um, yeah, um, any of your, any of your summer annuals, your geraniums, your, you know, stuff like that, any corn, tomatoes, eggplant, you're going to want to wait on that until at least the end of this month, early May, before you start um you know putting that stuff in the ground and as you mentioned we've had some cold in may and sometimes you're even um kind of compelled to cover that with either some uh row covers or if you have an old sheet um i noticed that a lot of people um want to put plastic over their plants when it gets cold and i want to want to advise against that um the plastic will cause a condensation that'll also um it can freeze that water right on the the foliage of the plants. So um, we always suggest either row covers or just use, put a bucket over it, put an old sheet over it, but whatever you do, try to avoid using plastic. Now, now the air temperature, of course, we know that can fluctuate a lot. I mean, like you said, it can be 70 one day and then, you know, 19, a couple of nights later, how quickly does the soil temperature change? Because we know that doesn't change as, as fast as the air does. The soil won't change as quickly, and if we've had it warm enough and the frost is then out of the soil, um, it's not likely to, you know, affect the Right, one one cold night's not going to change it. Correct, correct. But I will tell you this, um, soil temperature is important when it comes to, um, for example, lawn uh, grass seed will not germinate um, with a soil temp below 55, so... 
um, that's something that will be affected by your soil temperatures. Um, and that kind of goes along with the warm weather vegetables and stuff. You know, it's not going to do any good to put a put a fresh young plant into cold soil. It's just not going to grow. It's going to shiver. Um, once the soil comes up a little bit in temperatures, then you're going to get that nice root growth, what you're looking for. So uh, that does have a big effect on uh, growing as far as a lot of plants go. So Mike, don't be throwing that grass seed out there until probably at least May no. or, you know, June even. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not going to do anything with uh, overseeding or anything like that right now. Be- what, what are what are typical soil temperatures now, like in New Jersey and, you know, parts of the Northeast, uh, you know, as we start early April? Well, the frost is out of them, so um, I'm going to say, I'm guessing probably between right. about, I'm going to say hovering probably between 40 and 50. Okay. So it is actually warmer than I thought it would be, yeah. Um, but, you know, a few good days of sunshine and it warms right up. Um, after we get some consistent temperatures, you know, it'll stay that 50, 55 degrees. Um, but now it does fluctuate, um, you know, on the colder probably, side. You know, it probably depends on the depth of the soil you're talking about, too. Exactly. I'm sure it's colder, exactly. deeper, and vice versa in the summer. Exactly. So. Yeah, well, we're starting to get that grass starting to green up here now. That's one thing I have noticed. That is nice um, to get that, but not growing a whole lot just yet, but I'm sure that'll change here relatively uh, uh, soon. No, but you notice the buds on the trees now, too. You see more and more and a little more growth each – even after this cold snap we had uh, at the end of March, I mean, it's just still – things are growing despite, you know, it was below freezing a couple nights. I noticed that um, a lot of the things that we have in containers we'll have to cover or move indoors after the last really cold uh, temperatures – but if you'll notice, some of those same plants that are planted and in the ground, I can use an example of uh, a hellebore, for example, which is a, a perennial. Um, it blooms rather early. It's called Lenten rose, so it usually blooms around Easter time. Now, in spite of the cold weather, the the blooms were starting to push up. The flowers were pushing out. Uh, because that's been in the ground so long, it's not going to affect that like it would something in a pot. Um, it's, it's ready for it. And those flowers will be looking good today. They weren't looking too good for the last couple of days, but they'll be looking good again today after some sunshine and some, a uh, little bit warmer temperatures. So it makes a big difference whether it's in the ground or whether it's in a pot. Yeah. I mean, I forget what usually, um, oh, at my parents' house, they have a bunch of them, but there's usually something that pops up first thing. It seems like in the winter, I don't know if there were day lilies or something else. Um, but they're, they're always like in the ground and, and, and they always, I, I forget what they're called. Uh, maybe, maybe, you know, peonies. <laughs> maybe peonies yeah, it could be, early. um, but I know they always come up pretty early and I'm, and I'm always like, wow, look at that. The plants are growing. I'm get I get excited Nothing because stops. then it's like, Hey, yeah, we're, we're getting, we're getting out of winter. Finally, you know, we're starting to see some growth happening out of the flower beds and that, that makes me feel good inside. <laughs> and then the dandelions and all the weeds start. And you're like, oh, no, come on. Just when you get excited, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But but there's a positive to that also um, with the big push on um, trying to save the bee population. Um, I've noticed that really early on in the last few weeks um, on those warmer days, we'll see some um, honeybees flying around and they're searching because there is absolutely nothing out there for them. Um, so when the dandelions pop up, I actually I feel happy that they've actually got some food to eat <laughs> So uh, <laughs> there's not much when they first start coming out, but uh, those those dandelions will hold them over until we uh, get the rest of our stuff planted. Actually, it's funny you bring that up. Maybe you don't know the answer to this, but like when you get a war- like that first kind of warm day, even like March and you know by April, you always see a couple of bees that come out. Are, are they like scouting bees? Do they like like you just said they come out and see what's going on? They kind of do. They see if there's anything out there. There's a lot of also bees that are called solitary bees. Uh, they don't live in a hive, so they'll live in the stems of your perennials um, and in different areas that they're just solitary. They're not part of a hive, so they may have come out of their uh, winter space, you know, just looking for a little bit of uh, nutrition. Kind of like when the bears come out of hibernation. Yeah, that, it's interesting you mentioned that, uh, uh, Brad, because I saw a bee uh, just the other day when it was warm. Um, and I was like, hey, look at that. Yeah, <laughs> A bee is already out? Yeah. 
Well, as, well, well, we might as well move on to that part now. Let's, let's talk about the bugs and insects and the wild animals. And Mike, I think you have an example you were going to ask Denise about. Yeah, I did want to ask her something. Um, I've been having a little bit of a trouble, uh, a little bit of trouble with deer. Um, and I don't know if you know anything about it, but it keeps eating my maple tree sapling. Uh... Yeah, they do that. <laughs> um, unfortunately, that is a rather large problem that um most i would say at least three quarters of the people who come in have um a problem with deer and oftentimes not just one or two um they do like to eat the saplings they do like to eat a lot of the stuff that people plant um they have gone so far as um when there's a lot of snow on the ground and they're hard pressed to find food i mean they've eaten hemlock trees uh, which are usually pretty toxic um there is um there is some deterrence you know planting items that are either very fragrant uh they don't like things that smell such as lavender or you know anything with a potent smell to it um bee balm they also don't care for anything fuzzy uh so any leaves that you may have that are on the fuzzier side uh, lamb's ear stuff like that they don't really go for that kind of uh texture either um, but when you do have some things that you really cherish and you want to keep them off, we we usually just recommend uh, spraying something called Deer Stopper, a uh, product that we carry here. It's made locally, made in Washington, New Jersey. Um, I've been working with the Messina family since uh, since I started here with this product and I say I have used it for 20 years myself and the only time it doesn't work is when I forget to spray it so um, excellent product made of natural ingredients it's mints and rosemaries um, it's a nice product that you can spray on above and under the leaves you just mist it nicely you give it about 20 minutes a half an hour to dry before any moisture touches it and the product will actually last between four and six weeks um, unless we get in excess of about three inches of rain, you don't have to reapply. Uh, so that's been really, we've been really successful um, keeping them off of uh, the plants that we can't fence in or that they do like uh, by using the uh, Deer Stopper product. And there's many products out there. I'm just using that as a for example. Is that something that is uh, sold at the uh, store there in, at Thompson Park? Yep, absolutely. You can find it here. Um, we have several different um, products for for uh, deer. I find that one works the best. Um, I talked to some customers the other day who use a product that's a granular product. Uh, they put that down on the ground. The unfortunate part is unless, you're, unless your plants are down on the ground, it's not really going to have an effect on them because they're not sticking their nose into it if they're eating off the branches. So um, depending on what you're needing to protect, we have a variety of different products that will help keep them away from your plants well fortunately it looks like he's been leaving my maple tree alone now that it's gotten a little bit bigger it's still surviving you know he's not <laughs> you know the, the tree isn't dying now what does he eat mike just the leaves or does he actually eat the bark and stuff no he's eating like the stems and everything oh, and you know when it was really small and it was only maybe about a foot or so high i mean he was eating it down like almost to nothing but the tree kept coming back so i was like this is a hardy little tree <laughs> there's one benefit to that mike and i noticed that there's a particular holly bush in my yard that they like to chew on quite a bit but i noticed that it doesn't take long for the um the shrub to grow back and um it's kind of fuller and bigger and better than ever so um no, there you go. the same with cutting back plants however if they're chewing on that or chewing on stems, I like to nip off the end where they've had their mouth because uh, that kind of deters the growth. So if there's any little twigs or branches that you saw that they chewed on, I would give that a clean cut on the end. Well, the good thing is it doesn't look like he's done much with it this year. So I'm just concerned when the buds start popping and the and the little fresh leaves start showing up because they might find that as a good yeah, snack. We get so, you some deer but I in a hurry. yeah, I will look into that for sure. Um, but uh, that that's really uh, helpful. Thank you. 
So what, what's the most evasive kind of bug or insect that's just the biggest enemy to any kind of plants? Mm, Flowers there's so or many. There's vegetables. so yeah. many. Um, I guess so. There's such a variety depending on what uh, what plants we're talking about. That's what I mean. There, there's selective bugs that'll leave certain things alone and others they'll just go crazy on? Well, for example, like if you're planting an eggplant in your garden, that's more of a challenging plant, not because of its growth, but because it's attacked by something called a flea beetle and um, squash borer and cabbage worms on cauliflower. There's so many different um, insects that have their favorites. Um, little moths that fly out over the, um, the cabbage. And so I wouldn't say there's specifically one there's many, but there are products. Um, there's a lot of safe products out there that you can use. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, neem oil is a great um, deterrent that's of organic natural origin that you're not going to have to worry about applying onto your vegetables that you're going to eat later. Um, there's a lot of good stuff out there made for vegetable gardening, even when it comes down to weed preventer. Um, corn gluten is a great weed preventer in a vegetable garden and you're using something natural uh, that you're not going to be afraid to eat after after you pick it. Um, so it's in a variety of bugs and insects, whether it be inside the greenhouse or outside in your garden. Um, there's always a whole lot to try to contend with. Now, recently, I don't know if you've had them much in your neck of the woods just yet. Lanternfly? Yeah, the lanternfly. I lantern figured you were going to go there. <laughs> Um, well, I got to say, I mean, it was last year wasn't that bad at my house, but the year before that, there was so many, um, I didn't even know what to do with them. Um, but is there any type of, you know, deterrent for those guys? Cause I know it seems, <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> not yet. Um, we have, we don't have, I mean, people have tried different remedies. Some people say Dawn dish soap. Um, we have had a lot of, uh, different talks about this through, um, New Jersey Plant Association and whatnot. Um, what we have been recommending to people, especially in the fall, uh, they tend to lay their eggs and uh, their egg masses are easily identifiable. And we always suggest to people when they see those uh, to take something like we give out these little cards or almost like a credit card. You just scrape them off of the bark um, and then just smush as many as you can. <laughs> um, I would advise you, though, I've heard from several different sources um, your cats and dogs eating them is not a good thing. Um, I know my dog likes to eat things and bees and whatnot, but um, not a good thing for any of your animals to be eating those lantern flies, unfortunately. How does your dog eat bees? My dog is 130 <laughs> pounds. <laughs> He's a big boy. <laughs> He'll eat whatever oh comes Why his would he way. Be He'll eat moths. <laughs> yeah, so I can get him to eat some of the bugs, but not all of them. Okay. Um, you know, moving on to another topic, though, uh, you know, soil prep, soil types. Um, for example, uh, at my house, I have a lot of shale in, in the soil. So a lot of rocky soil and shale. Um, do you have some tips on how to remediate this the best way? Yes, absolutely. Um if you find that you have um, rocky soil, uh, even clay soil, there's there's uh, remedies for all different types to get it um, to the point where you can grow pretty much whatever you'd like. Um, as far as um, I would suggest using a compost, incorporating a natural compost into your uh, topsoil, into your garden, and that'll provide a lot of nutrients. Um, adding fresh topsoil in itself always helps, um, but to kind of, um, depending on, I always recommend a pH test of your lawn. I have a product here that I really recommend um, a lot of people use for different uh, types of uses, especially in your vegetable garden. It's called Magic Cow, and it's a combination of magnesium and calcium. Um, Putting that in your garden will really regulate the pH of the soil. Um, 
it will help, especially with things like tomatoes to avoid cracking. Um, it'll level it out so that depending on what you're planting, um, certain plants like a more acidic, for, exa uh, for example, blueberry bushes, they prefer a more acidic soil. So by giving your soil a test, you can determine um, what best to plant where and what amendments you're going to want to add to get to the, um, to the pH that you're looking for. Interesting. Yeah, no, that's, that's certainly good some good tips there because uh, I've been thinking about getting a garden going. I used to have one at my old house. Now that we uh, built a new house and I had such rocky soil, I was kind of at a loss of uh, where to start with that other than, like you said, almost like bringing in brand new topsoil where I'm going to plant the garden and maybe make a raised bed. It wouldn't. It wouldn't hurt. I mean, I've used um, I've used a tiller in some rocky. I I built one in my parents' uh, yard, a garden for them, and they lived in the middle of um, rocks. So I spent a long time tilling, um, and then I did bring in some fresh topsoil, um, but not so much that that was all I used. Um, try to use some of the soil from you know, where, where you're at, um, till that up, add a little bit of fresh. Um, we'll also do a mixture of topsoil and compost, put that in there. Um, fertilizing throughout the season as well. Um, I think a lot of people don't think about that. You know, you, you think about fertilizer when you're watering your flower baskets and whatnot, but, uh, your vegetable garden is definitely a place where you want to keep those nutrients flowing, um, and growing bigger and better, vegetables, um, the Magical is going to level out the pH, and then there's all different types of um, garden fertilizers specific to what you're growing. You can use a general all-purpose. You can use something geared more to tomatoes or, um, you know, basically we have uh, an assortment of products for whatever it is that you're looking to grow. You can do a, a once-over in the garden with a triple 10, and um, you're good for a few weeks before you have to start um, reapplying any kind of um, amendments or, or nutrients. What about folks that live a little closer to the coast and have more of a sandy soil? I mean, are there better plants, I guess, for down there? or Yes, there's definitely better plants for down the shore that will tolerate uh, more of a salt um, you know, salt in the air, salt in the, the soil and water. Um, the soil will need to be amended down there as well, just because the sand will allow excess drainage and then your plants tend to dry out a little bit. Um, the ideal soil that you're looking for is a loamy soil. And that's a soil that when you squeeze it together, it kind of holds together loosely. It's not clay, it's not sand, but it's a beautiful blend kind of in between that. Loamy soil. It's a, it's a word of the day. Huh. Loamy soil. Yes, um, for sure. Um, well, I know one thing I won't be planting in my garden is that is strawberries. Okay. Um, because <laughs> <laughs> what happened was, is I had a garden and I had half of it strawberries for my kids. And then basically the next year, the strawberries took over the whole garden. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had to build a new garden <laughs> next to that for my, for my, yeah, of course. But then for, for my tomatoes and peppers and, and, and carrots and stuff like that, I had to build like a separate garden um, because they took over the first one. <laughs> so Okay. All right. I got a suggestion for you. Keep the kids happy. Plant your strawberries in hanging baskets. Okay. All right. Hanging baskets. So that's a neat thing to do with kids. Um, and then you can control them. And you don't have to build a new a new uh, garden for the rest of your vegetables. Uh, but, yeah, they like to do um, kids, especially growing strawberries, growing cherry tomatoes in hanging baskets, uh, growing the little snack peppers in containers. There's a great amount of stuff um, and fun stuff for them to be able to do as well. You know, when they can, you know, stuff their little hands can hold and pick and. Um, like I said before, the kids seem to be really into it. So um, if you don't want a uh, plethora of strawberries, you can try putting a, a few of those in some pots and hanging baskets and growing them that way. So let's uh, let's let's get weather back involved here a little bit. Um, let's let's talk about plants and veggies or fruits. What, what does better with wet weather when it's when you have a long maybe streak of you know, a lot of storms and, you know, like you say, you get a couple of inches of rain within uh, a week or two. I mean, do, do certain, you know, plants and, and 
you know, vegetables and stuff, they do better when it's wet versus dry and vice versa? There are a whole uh, line of, especially in the perennials, um, of, of plants that really enjoy a wet soil or a plethora of rain. Um, willows of all types, willow trees, willow shrubs, um, definitely water lovers, iris, things like lobelia. Um, there's definitely a whole market full of perennials, shrubs, and trees that prefer a moisture. It would do well by a uh, pond's edge. It would be you know, a great thing if you've got a, a low spot in your lawn or your, your yard that you want to plant something that's going to pull up that extra water. Uh, there definitely is. Um, there are also plants that definitely do not like the extra water and um, you will be very disappointed with them <laughs> if uh, we wind up with you know two weeks straight of cloudy rainy weather um, it's really going to put the damper on things like petunias and and geraniums you know floral more of the floral uh, end of things but uh, so the the rain will affect in a good way and in a bad way depending on which plant you're so if we head more into a drier pattern what would be more suited to be a little bit more rugged in handling that. Well, there is definitely, and those plants uh, that would tolerate a drier situation would also be those that um, will do well down, you know, where there's a little bit more, uh, like down the shore area that will thrive a little bit more. Um, I'll tell you, there's there's a lot more plants that like water than like no water. <laughs> Well, it, it seems, yeah, of course. I mean, you always need water and sunlight, it seems, for a lot of things you want to be growing. So uh, it's understandable that there's not many plants that like dry conditions, that's for sure, unless it's a cactus or something. Well, yeah, I didn't want to have to say <laughs> cactus or, or yucca plant. A yucca, you know, a lot of people put those in their yard, but um, I I am very... It's very important to get people to realize whenever they do plant something, and not just a flower, not just a shrub, but especially a tree, um, a line of trees, when you tell them, you know, you need to water them, and they look at you like you've got, you know, you're crazy, and but, but it rains. Well, no, <laughs> um, especially anything like a tree or a shrub, newly planted, needs to have water on a very regular basis to get those roots in and get them established. Um, you're going to see right away if that plant's not getting what it needs. It's going to show you, it's not going to wait, it's not going to die in eight months from now. If it's not getting what it needs, it's going to show you right away. Um, the leaves will start, you know, drying out, curling, dropping, um, a lot of times plants can be rescued, even though they've dried out and they look terrible. Um, their plants are pretty resilient, um, but you can only take them so far. And if you don't do that consistent watering, um, you are going to affect the health of the plant overall. So um, that I think water is just such a key issue and rain is great. But I usually tell people if they put out a can like a tuna fish can and captured the amount of rain that came down, you'd see that that would only fill that that can part way up. Well, that's as far down into the soil as the rain's going. So it's not at all reaching um, the root system that really needs that water. So um, even putting water in the hole when you dig it to put your plant in is highly recommended. Uh, I mean, there's a couple of times where I've you know, done some landscaping jobs in the past uh, and I've planted and, you know, a, a week later they're telling me that, hey, these things died on me. It's like, well, how much were you, were you watering them? Like I told you water <laughs> to make sure you, yeah. <laughs> and they're like, well, I, I did a little bit after you left. And then, you know, then I waited a few days and then I did it again. Like, no, no, no. <laughs> that that's that's the problem like you gotta water like when i put in all my landscaping at my house here i was watering daily you know just to make sure that those plants you know had enough i mean obviously it's it's rough when a plant you know first goes into the ground it has to have all has to have all those nutrients in the water like you're saying so a lot of shock when it goes in there usually what i'll tell people to make it easy for them is just lay the hose down by the the drip line of the plant which is where the edge of the root ball is 
uh, put the hose on a trickle, lay it down there and walk away for about, you know, 20 minutes, depending on the size of the plant, of course. But, you know, just leave it there and that will slow water it into where it'll actually reach those roots and the plant will benefit from it. Um, spraying a hose at something isn't going to water it, that's for sure. And I think um, you got to make, make it really clear when you're teaching them how to do it, um, how to do it properly or they're not going to see the results that they're looking for. All right, here's a, here's a, a spot question. How do you pick out the best watermelon in the summer? I always hear different things. Ah, it's, it's heavier than it looks, or the the yellow spot is supposed to be bigger. And, and I, I just I just always want to ask everyone. There's something about a, a yellow spot on the end. I knock on it. I don't know. I don't know what I'm expecting to hear. I guess okay. if it sounds hollow, that's ready to go. And, and I don't know. I don't know. Um they grow great watermelons here. I haven't gotten a bad one yet, so I don't. I just <laughs> knock on it, and you know, if it sounds hollow, I pick it up. <laughs> That's that fine. No, I just wasn't sure if there was like a scientific answer. There, there or may like... be. There may very well be, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've always just gone by the weight. If it feels heavier than the other ones, like maybe it's got you know more stuff in it or more like water more in it or, or yeah, more, that's yeah. Heard of so, it. if it feels heavier than it really looks or something like that it's... right i kind of use that when i pick out oranges and stuff too it's like this orange feels heavier than the other orange so i'm gonna go with that um as as they're not so your produce, um, it's good <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true that's true um so the next topic uh we were thinking about is uh indoor gardening are there any options to to doing things indoors. I know a lot of people like to start from from seeds and uh, they may start indoors first and then transplant those into their garden later. Now we're talking about legal things that you can grow now, right, Mike? Yeah, no, come on. Now. Well, I guess of course. Well, I, I guess those things are legal now anyway, so it's... No, no, no. Okay. Listen. Okay. Come on. <laughs> this is a this is a clean podcast. This is a family sir. show. Come on. Um, a lot of people do like to start their seeds indoors. Um, the thing about growing indoors is that you need a substantial amount of light. So if you've got a sunroom, if you've got some grow lights, that's fantastic. Uh, because that's probably one of the key elements of indoor gardening is the um, amount of light that you're getting. So great to start seeds in there right now. Um, nice and warm, they'll germinate. Uh, you can keep monitoring their water um, uptake and you can thin them out. You can keep them at a reasonable size. Um, once you get to a point though, the plants are gonna start stretching for the light because it's just not gonna be enough. So you're gonna see your plants starting to stretch a little bit. Um, you're gonna wanna move those guys outside before they start to stretch. Then they get lanky and they're weak. Um, so starting the seeds indoors is fine. Um, house plants in general, great to grow in there, um, that require very little light or lower light levels than, um, your, your outdoor plants. Um, a lot of people want to bring herbs and stuff inside, which is fine if you've got a great, uh, like a bright sunny window to put them on. Um, but in my opinion, nothing grows as good in the house as it will outdoors except house plants, except house plants. Um, a lot of people like to bring, you know, they'll buy these beautiful hibiscus standard trees or uh, something tropical that they've got out on the, the porch or the patio for the summer. And, you know, you spend good money. You don't really want to toss that in the compost pile. So um, a lot of people will bring them in and winter them over. And that's doable. Um, the problem with that is in the lower light levels um, when we start having the shorter days. Um, plants are very, very affected by that. It affects their, their flowering cycles. So you're not going to see the beautiful flowers on it like you have in the, you know, in the spring and summer um, until you get those longer days starting again, which is, which is what's happening now. So you'll start to see a lot of growth happening as the days start to lengthen. Yeah, I even think about that as as we get even into like August, September. I mean, the days are, are already starting to get shorter and shorter, and I'm sure that, you know, affects a lot of the plants huh yeah it makes a big difference it really affects you can see things starting to slow down in their flowering starting to almost prep themselves for either dormancy or you know uh start producing seeds to 
you know, reproduce, um, but the light levels have so much to do. A lot of the plants that we plant, um, you know, we're looking for things that are daylight neutral, for example, so that we can start them early and we're still going to get the growth out of them. Um, but yeah, daylight plays a big, big part in flowering specifically, but plant growth in general. So I was curious, uh, Denise, um, when it comes to um, when you're going to get a frost or a freeze or something like that, and you have plants outside that are susceptible to it, um, what would you recommend would be the best thing um, to cover those plants with? Because I see people covering plants with all types of different things, and I'm sure some of it is not right. <laughs> oh, you can be, you can bet on that. Yes. Um, well, definitely, if you have things that are still potted, that's easily movable. And most people will leave their stuff in the pots until they're getting fairly certain that you know frost is looking you know less and less like a possibility. Um, as I mentioned before, do not use plastic for covering anything. Um, it'll burn the plants and it'll create condensation, but um, frost blanket, cr uh, row covers, even if you have some things that are in the ground, you wanna take an empty pot and put that over top of it, um, just to basically keep the frost off the plant. If you're in an area that has trees that have already leafed out, I find that that pr protects it very nicely. I live more in a wooded area and I don't find that I have um, frost problems nearly as much because I have so much coverage from those trees. And I think just the warmth in general, it's a little bit, um, you know, if you're closer to the house, you've got a little bit more warmth, but you need that protection over top to keep the frost off. Okay. Note to self, call mom <laughs> and let her know to stop using plastic bags. No plastic bags. <laughs> no. I, I know I've seen her put, uh, like the plastic bag you get from your local grocery store and kind of put that over top of things and I mean it seems like a simple solution but your plants might not come out um as good as they could with other alternatives so so when you see like uh let's take for example like Florida and stuff in the middle of winter when they have these you know they get freezing temperatures and you always read about how they're spraying their fruits and their oranges they're turning on their irrigation so right so they can get that layer of, of ice on it we do that yeah, we do that. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll do that. Um, turn the turn the uh, irrigation on early in the morning to keep it wet, so that that frost doesn't settle on it and burn. So that usually, well, you guys know more about temperatures than I do, but um, it'll get colder and then it'll start warming up again. And when you know, once the temperature reaches a certain point, we can shut those sprinklers off and it's all good. So, um, yeah, that's what the citrus growers will do, too. They'll put their irrigation on to try to keep the frost off by keeping them wet. And then even when it gets ice on those sometimes, I mean, that's OK-ish? It's OK. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, it seems to work for us. Let's put it that way. Yes, it does. Um, I, I guess there's within limits, though, too, to this. Well, farmer's been farming a long time, so I trust his uh, his knowledge. And yeah, we haven't lost crops that way. But I'll tell you what, there's a a tremendous amount of work that goes on in the springtime. You know, between bringing plants in, getting them all in, getting them laid out where they go, and then having a couple nights like the other night where either we have to put everything on racks and move it back in, or we've got to put row covers over it and tarps and cover everything up. And um, we try, you know, not that we don't want to have business or anything, but I mean, I try to recommend to people just hang on and wait a little bit because the, the plant is not going to grow in this cold weather anyway. Um, so just let us take care of it where it's, you know, happy and warm and whatnot. And come pick it up in a couple of weeks when you don't have to work so hard at it. Right. Yeah, no, that sounds great. Now, now an another weather, uh, I guess, uh, impact and, and every plant in the middle of the summer loves a good thunderstorm, I'm sure. Every vegetable. And they probably like that good dose of water they're going to get. And, you know, but have you ever had a problem with a hailstorm? Because I'm sure you you read about how these crops get just completely obliterated, like out in the Midwest when they get these. You know, we don't really deal with that here in the Northeast, but they get these softball size hail events. I mean, have you ever had to dealt, deal with that here? 
Oh my goodness, yes. Uh, maybe not softball size, but I'll tell you what, the peaches have been hammered out here many a times um, by hail. Not necessarily, I mean, quarter size is enough to... I was going to say, what, what's the size that yeah, you would... Well, that's about an inch hail, yeah. Yeah, I would say probably, you know, quarter size hail. Um, and then, you know, that just destroys the fruit. It looks terrible. So fruit trees, I'm going to say, suffer really really badly. Um, I've seen some storms where just flattened uh, fields of corn. You know, there's different, different storms will affect different um, plants, obviously. But yeah, the hail is really brutal on the on the fruit trees. I could imagine. I mean, it, you just think about doing it to your car, you get dents in your car if the hail's big enough. I couldn't even imagine. And I guess there's really nothing you can do about it. I mean, you can park your car in a garage or go to a, like a car wash place. And I've done that before, but I guess you can't. It's just the mercy of the of Mother Nature then. Yes, you cannot cover your peach, uh, your peach orchard. Definitely not. Um, so and that's pretty much that's farming, I guess, is, you know, you just have to roll with whatever Mother Nature throws at you. And it's different every year. You never know what to expect. You just got to be ready for anything. OK, um, so you mentioned peaches and stuff like that. Um, so talk a little bit more about Donaldson Farms. Like when we're there, I mean, what what can you do? Can you pick your own? Can you can you come for uh, pumpkins in the fall? Uh, what, what's all going on? Yes. As far as pick your own, um, they start with strawberries, which usually are ready, um, depending on the weather, um, late May, early June. Wow, and that early, huh? Yeah, they, um, you know, they go into usually beginning of July. Or Mike's backyard, too. We can go there. <laughs> oh, yeah. For, for the strawberries. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's got a bunch. Um, so pick your own strawberries, and they also have pick your own apples and pumpkins. Um, pick your own apples, believe it or not, starts towards the end of August, um, beginning of September, for some of the earlier varieties. Um, I think people aren't quite in that apple picking mode just yet. They're kind of waiting for the, you know, the fall, the cold, the crisp days and whatnot but there's a lot of really great there's a zestar apple that's an early variety that's a, a fantastic eating apple um so they'll start picking you and pick your own apples um pretty much whenever the first you know the first crops are ready um pick your own pumpkins that's always a big um you know, big, a big deal. And, um, for years they have done the sunflower tours, which was another really well attended, um, item of interest here on the farm. Um, they would take them around on hay rides and you could jump off and photograph. And at the end of the season, after, uh, all the sunflowers were harvested and, uh, combined, they were donated then to the Audubon Society in New Jersey. So that was a great thing. Great. Um, uh, that they've been doing for the last few years. Yeah, I got a question. What was that name of that apple again? Zestar. Z e s t a r. Wait, what was it? Oh, Zestar. I never heard of that. Huh? Hmm. I have to look into that. I know my favorite apple variety is Honeycrisp. I don't know. If, do you have? Yeah, I think. Oh, when's the yeah. best time to get some Honeycrisp? Uh, get some honey crisp. I'm gonna say at the end of September. End of September, okay. End of September. Yep. I gotta remember that because end of September, mid mid to late September. I'm gonna fresh say. from the fresh from the orchard. Fresh from the oh, tree. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And that's great <laughs> stuff, you know, taking the kids' apple picking, and then you don't have to grow an orchard at home. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Hey, and while we're talking about Donaldson Farms too, what what goes uh, the the Sunday? Uh, was it Friday night? Uh, summer nights on the farm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So usually uh, later in June, when we first start having some of our, you know, our own crops available and ready, um, great food being offered there. For the first few years, uh, we had a lot of local chefs would come to the farm market and prepare a menu for the evening, of which you could buy an entire dinner. You could buy piecemeal um, a la carte. There's stuff for kids, um, you know, hot dogs, chicken fingers, burgers, milkshakes, and um, there is always a live band. And pretty much it's just a great place to come. If you got kids, you want to bring your kids, you know, you can kind of let them go and not have to worry about them. There's a lot of fun activities for the kids to do. There's a lot of fun activities for the adults to do, too. Uh, bring yourself a bottle of wine or 
couple of cold ones and just sit back, enjoy the evening. It's really, uh, it's really a fun time. Well, that sounds like a, a lot of fun. I think I might, I think Brad and I are going to make it out to one of those, uh, Friday nights. Um, I know that. Oh, you absolutely should. Yeah. Yeah. For weather work. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely should. And there's a lot of um, – they have a lot of uh, people come out uh, teaching the kids, whether it's about animals. They'll have uh, the fire department come out and show them all about the fire trucks. And there is just a lot uh, a lot of really good stuff, very family-oriented, very child-oriented as well, and um, fun. It's a lot of fun. Local community stuff too. I guess a lot of, a lot of uh, Hackettstown folks come in there. It is. Uh, the Donaldsons are very uh, community oriented, very involved in their community and um, try to be as helpful as they can. Great. All right, Denise. Well, I, I think that about does it for our podcast. Uh, thanks so much for coming out. It was quite my pleasure. I appreciate you having me. All right. So hopefully everybody who's been listening to this podcast got some really good information from Denise about uh, when to start planting their gardens and their plants and and, and how to even remediate your gardens if you're having some issues with rocky soils. But we've talked about a lot here, so um, I hope it, you found it very interesting. I know I did. Um, and remember, we are the Weather Lounge, and the uh, podcast will have new episodes every two weeks, so come back and listen. Our parent company is weatherworks.com. Go ahead and visit that website. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.